Um, right. Um, thank you. Um, yeah, as, as introduced, I'll be talking about our paper Time is Money, Strategic Timing Games and Proof of Stake Protocols. Um, this is joint work with my colleagues Barnaby and Tomar and Fahad from Wake Forest University and Jennifer and Niha from Jump Crypto. You'll forgive me for um, skimming through some of these slides um, as this talk is shorter than the last time I presented this paper. Um, before jumping into the specifics of this um, of uh, the timing games, um, I want to briefly motivate why we should care about them in the first place. So typically, consensus protocols are um, evaluated based on their ability to maintain liveness and safety. Um, liveness being the regular addition of um, new transactions to the output ledger in a somewhat timely manner. So essentially, what that says is if you have a valid transaction that pays enough fees, um, then that transaction should be included relatively soon in, uh, in the chain. And then safety being essentially the security of these confirmed transactions uh, in their position, positions within the ledger. So once included in the chain, they shouldn't jump around in, the, in their position. Um, and we, we make this point that um, in blockchain protocols, we also care about um, fairness of economic outcomes amongst consensus participants. And the, the gist of it is basically that we care about decentralization and we want the um, honest protocol participation to be maximally profitable, um, such that there are no incentives to deviate from the honest protocol um, so that we don't have any sort of deviating consensus participant that may outcompete honest participation, um, which would ultimately lead to a, albeit slow, but nonetheless, um, so centralization of the set of um, consensus participants. Um, now, there's this thing, MEV, maximal extractable value, that kind of frustrates such fairness goals, or makes it harder at least. Um, what is MEV? What is this maximal extractable value? Well, simply, it's, it's the value that consensus participants, in their role as block proposers, can extract by including excluding and ordering transactions. Um, including, excluding makes intuitive sense. Um, so transactions um, pay a tip to the blo block proposer and so um, a tip is good for the block proposer and so including that obviously <laughs> contains value for the proposer. Now why, why does the order, um, how does the order have value? To give a brief quick example, um, consider a decentralized exchange A and B and um, say and say Alice wants to buy a bunch of ETH using some token, say a stablecoin like Dai. Um, now, assuming that the price of these exchanges is the same initially, if Alice buys a huge amount of ETH on Exchange A, then that will push up the price. And now Bob may want to arbitrage the price difference between Exchange A and B um, by buying cheap ETH on B and selling it on A until we have a new price level that is consistent across A and B. Now the thing is, Charlie might also want to arbitrage that opportunity. And so we begin to see that um, the order of transactions matters because only the first one extracting the, the first one being the first transaction that captures this arbitrage is the one capturing the value. And so Bob and Charlie are willing to pay for the order of this transaction to express that um, uh, preference. And so, um, point being, MEV uh, is, a, is a big thing in consensus protocols, has been studied in, in various scenarios. I'm not going to go into the details here, um, but the, the main takeaway here is that um, MEV accrues over time as users submit transactions. Um, and essentially, as time goes on, more transactions enter the mempool, which then the proposer eventually can include and order in their block when it is their turn. And the important thing here is that time is valuable to consensus participants as a, as a kind of consequence of that. Um, meaning that, yeah, as time goes on, um, proposers can capture some of that value. And we'll get to the point of timing games and how that fits into, in, into those. And, this feature of um, um, this sort of feature is kind of obviated by the assumption of honest behavior um, in, in typical models of consensus, where we um, 
where we use this notion of honest versus Byzantine uh, uh, protocol participation. And so rational, consen rational consensus participation would potentially provide a more accurate portrayal of behavior in economically incentivized um, systems such as blockchain protocols. Um, and so to set up the intuition for timing games, um, briefly, um, time in Ethereum is divided into slots. Slots are 12 seconds long. And so in a happy path case, every slot, there is a block proposer that shows up proposing a block. And then there's a committee of the testers voting for this block. Um, I'm here using Ethereum as the example, um, but these dynamics take place in um, propose vote type of uh, protocols where we have a proposer and then a committee of um, a testers voting for such uh, on, the, on what they see as the head of the chain. Um, but point being, I'm going to use Ethereum as an example um, to build up some intuition. And here this is from the honest um, uh, honest protocol specification of Ethereum. And what it basically says is we have in the slot, we have some duties, one being obviously a block proposal, um, which is um, to propose a block at the beginning of a slot. Uh, and um, now four seconds into the slot, we have something called the testation deadline, which essentially says, um, and the tester is supposed to vote for the block either when they hear, as soon as they hear a valid block or four seconds into the slot. So whichever comes first. If you hear a block at two seconds into the slot, you attest to it immediately. If you don't hear anything until four seconds, you vote for whatever you see as um, the head of the chain at the time. So probably the parent block. Um, now, let's look at some different scenarios in what can happen in a slot. So here we see that um, block proposer N shows up somewhat on time such at least it's before the attestation deadline, such that 100% uh, of the committee sees it, votes for it since it's valid. Um, and yeah, and then block n plus one comes along, sees n, everyone voted for it, seems to be canonical, so it, n plus one extends the chain. Um, here we see, we start to begin, uh, we see a different scenario. So here block n plus one seems to be late. So um, at four seconds, at the attestation deadline, the committee has not seen uh, any, any block, and so they vote anyways and say, okay, so given my current view of uh, things, block N is the head of the chain, and so that's what they vote for. And then eventually N plus one comes along, but it's after the attestation deadline. They try to build on N, but N plus two sees that no one voted for N plus one, and so um, I'm obviously skimming through some sort of fork choice, fork choice um, rule specifics, but this is the gist of it. And so n plus two would extend on top of block n, essentially n plus one being too late to become canonical. And so here we see that there's this kind of wiggle room of being early enough and being too late. And the timing game and understanding that time is valuable, um, we see that you might want to be early enough to become canonical, but as late as possible to extract um, as much value as possible. Um, so I guess I jumped a little bit ahead here, but so essentially in our model, what we um, we have we have proposals that whose payoffs uh, increase linearly in time um, relative to the most recent canonical block. Um, assuming that their block, if their block becomes canonical itself. So what this means is um, the payoff of a proposer is increasing in time. Now your block has to become canonical for um, you to capture that value. So this, the, if you're canonical, you can capture value. And then the value you can capture from MEV is um, essentially the time difference between the previous canonical block and your block, because that's the time over which you get to kind of listen to the mempool and extract the MEV that accumulates during that time. Um, and so again, the intuition here is relatively straightforward, propose as late as possible while ensuring that you're early enough to actually become canonical. Um, and then we have the uh, testers that obviously also take part in this game and they care about two things, one being correctness and the other one being freshness. Correctness here, um, basically saying you, you want to vote correctly and it's kind of like a beauty contest where you want to vote alongside the majority of people. 
Um, so if everyone thinks block n is canonical, um, you want to vote uh, for that as well, essentially. And the other thing is you want to be fresh because the value of voting for a head degrades over time. And so the reward kind of depends on being timely. So um, in other words, the, the vote needs to be released before the next block proposal releases their block so that it can be included on chain and um, used for, for kind of consensus rewards. Um, and so what we see is that there's this tension between um, waiting for as long as possible, both for the um, proposer, because they want to capture the MEV, but also for the attesters who want to have as much, as, as much information as possible so that they can vote correctly. Um, because the more time, they, the more um, attestations you probably see, and so the more information you have to vote correctly. But the tension, or the other side of the coin being that if you're too late, you don't receive any rewards. And so there's this tension between these two dynamics. Um, and, and our um, model that we define in, in the paper more formally, um, we have the static model where time is partitioned into slots with a block proposal and a committee of testers each round. And the proposer um, chooses then to extend the chain or not and when to release the block. And testers, in turn, they choose when to release to vote for a block, or when they, if they don't want to vote for a block, they vote empty. Um, and so, importantly, it's a static game, and so players choose a schedule of actions at the beginning of the game. Um, and we then show um, that there's a, there exists a multiplicity of equilibria, meaning that, um, in fact, there's an infinite amount of equilibria that a testers can coordinate to implement, basically, testers can coordinate to implement proposals acting at any particular time within the slot. Um, if we go to the Ethereum example, we have this attestation deadline at four seconds. And so this is one of such equilibria, but it could also be 4.1 or 4.5 or whatever, as long as it's within that slot. And so testers essentially can force proposals to adhere to their voting schedule, but given any voting schedule proposers will uh, release as late as possible um, given any attestation deadline, which is in contrast to the current um, honest specification in the Ethereum protocol where it simply says propose at the beginning of the slot. Um, now let me quickly run through some of the empirical analysis we did. I saw Patrick showing some signs already um, quickly. There's this notion of proposer builder separation in Ethereum, which essentially is all about the fact that capturing MEV opportunities is a non trivial task. It's complex. Finding all these arbitrage opportunities is nothing that a homestaker should be con concerned about. And so there's this idea of proposer builder separation where you're trying to firewall off this complexity by the proposer auctioning off the right to specialized parties to build the block for them. Um, so that the proposer can still capture most of that value, but doesn't have to find all these opportunity themselves. And MEV Boost is currently um, the system that most of Ethereum uses to participate in this uh, sort of block auction. And there's a bunch of actors, um, obviously um, involved in this MEV Boost um, world, uh, uses submit transactions, searches other ones, finding these MEV opportunities, sending transaction builders to um, so-called block builders, who in turn try to build maximally profitable blocks given a set of searcher bundles and transactions in the mempool. And these builders then bid for the right to build the block um, to the block proposer. Um, and because um, the block builder doesn't necessarily trust the proposer and vice versa, um, there's this actor called a relay, which sort of acts as a trust facilitator between builders and proposers. Um, and what they do is they ensure black block validity and um, bid payment, um, but they also keep the builder's content private such that the proposer cannot steal the content, but the proposer also doesn't have to verify everything because they can trust the relay in this setting. And then the proposer can essentially locally build a block or accept a bid through this um, MEV boost. Um, and as a fun fact, uh, or not fun fact, but just for curiosity, uh, roughly 90% of all Ethereum validators are running currently MEV boost. 
Um, data, basically, we looked at a bunch of bidding data of um, collected by the ultrasound relay, which is one of the um, relays operating, collecting uh, data over more than a month earlier this year. Um, uh, given the time constraint, um, there is essentially each bit comes with a couple timestamps that we use to kind of investigate these dynamics. We have all bits and then we have bits that are winning bits. Um, these bits come in over time, values increasing as more MEV is ex to be extracted. The time the bits are received, eventually the proposer requests the bid, um, signs it, and then once it's signed, it's essentially um, the, the, the relay can then release the block given the signed header that the proposer just sent. Um, and the basic question we ask is, what's the value of time? Is it increasing, essentially? Um, is, and what we did is we looked at all bits collected by the relay um, and used the timestamp associated with it um, to understand uh, how relative to the next slot. So here we see essentially 10 seconds before the next slot begins, the value is uh, low and then over time it increases um, linearly. And the, the important point here is that rather than look, looking at absolute values, I think given current times and this data, it's roughly 10 bucks a second, um, just to give a ballpark. But the important takeaway here is it's linearly increasing in time as opposed to um, like we shouldn't be concerned with the, the absolute value too much at this point. Um, now, are the timing games being played? Um, and to answer that, what we did is we looked at winning bits now. Not all bits, but winning bits. And the winning bits, interestingly, are received relatively on time, roughly 150 milliseconds into the slot. Um, but they're only signed at around 750 milliseconds into the slot. And so there's this time differential of... Um, um, and there's this time differential, and so what kind of follows from this is like basically what this means is a proposer they lock in 150 they, they lock in the MEV they can extract at 150 milliseconds, even though they only sign it at 750 milliseconds. Uh, point being, timing games are being played to some extent, definitely not to their fullest extent, which in Ethereum's case would be. Uh, signing and releasing blocks roughly around the four, attestation deadline in four seconds. Um, why is that the case? Uh, knowledge, uh, sophistication, reputation, social pressure, sort of. Um, but obviously, yeah. Maybe quickly conclusions and implications. Well, timing games are rational. They take place, but not to their full extent. Um, What's good is that testers can contain the timing game so they can make sure that it is limited to what extent it's possible. Um, but the bad thing is that proposers will abuse their monopoly power that they have in uh, given any attestation line to the, as much as they can in the model. In the real world, I would expect this to uh, happen over time potentially. Um, and then the other bad thing is that sophisticated actors are probably in a better position to play these timing games uh, because they can just in invest in sophisticated P2P setups, etc. Um, thank you. More details in the paper. Please do read. Thank you so much. Thank you. I don't know if we have time for questions. I think, you, I think we have uh, one or two minutes here if anyone has anything quick. Yeah, go ahead. One so second. I have a question. What is the thinking right now on, uh, on propagation delays in Ethereum with respect to after you propose, how long does it take for sort of all of the attesters to understand the blocks there? And how does this play into the probability of becoming canonical if you flirt with that four second line? Like, can you sort of see a smooth transition of being 100% canonical to like hit or miss? To, like, how does that sort of area look right now? So if you can you repeat the question for the reporting? Yeah. So I think for a future question, the reporting will only pick up through the mic. Okay. Right. Uh, so I guess the question is somewhat like, um, as a block proposer, if you want to play this timing game maximally, you're going to run the risk that some testers hear you in time and some don't, because it's obviously not binary. Everyone, either everyone hears you or no one hears you, and. Uh, Basically, yeah, if you want to play this game maximally aggressively, you would want to 
in Ethereum's case, you would want to even split the committee in sort of two camps where say 40% hear you um, in time and so they vote for your block and 60% don't hear you in time and so they vote for the parent block because fork choice stuff in Ethereum, you need to at least accumulate 40% to be reorg resistance against the next block proposal. Point being, that's precisely correct. Um, the thing is, the, the drop-off is very steep, so it's very hard to kind of, um, like, risking that 40% is like, yeah, it's, it's pretty, because you have thousands of nodes, it's actually, the, 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 I actually maybe have a plot uh, in here. Here you see kind of, um, uh, here you kind of see how this, um, I don't remember what block signed that, but, and yeah, so this is the share of attestations that vote for the block which was released. Um, so if you see here, you can see around three seconds you have this sharp drop off. Um, if you release afterwards, you won't make it canon, but you see that it's kind of relatively sharp, so it's hard to, uh, yeah, you have to be before that. <laughs> Very nice. Yeah, um, I think uh, I think that's all the time we have for this one. All right. uh, it was great to see this at SPC already too. It's it's awesome to see it again because it brings new memories uh, or new ideas. I think uh, it'll be interesting to see if um, you know this dynamics uh, incentivize more like out of protocol block dissemination information if it means you can increase your profit, right. which is interesting.